Hello, everybody. This is Cami Smith from Fiber Art Now. I look forward to uh, talking today with um, Jeannie Flanagan. And uh, we really appreciate uh, the National Basketry Organization for being our sponsor today. Um, if you get a chance to follow them on Facebook, they have some splendid uh, images that they're always posting of their members. Um, and we've been a nice partnership with uh, uh, Fiber Art Now and, and National Basketry Organization, so it's appreciative that they took the time to help us sponsor this, uh, this conversation with Jean. Um, all right, hello Jean. I'm gonna look at, I love that, that shoe. That shoe is too, too wonderful there. Um, hi. <laughs> <laughs> Live from your studio in the New England area, um, I wanted to. Uh, we, this is going to be fun because Jean's got uh, the, her laptop on rollers, and so uh, we're going to be rolling around her studio and getting a real high-tech uh, bird's eye view. Um, okay, so good, Victoria. You're on the. The we have a person here online that's having trouble getting, not getting any audio. I hope that's going to work. Sometimes going out and in again helps, I know. Um, okay, and it is recorded, so we're all good. So Jean, um, hello. I just, uh, we love looking at all the different materials you use, so I always um, generally try to start these conversations um, asking the artist how much of their inspiration is based on the materials? A lot of it. I think 50% of my inspiration is based on materials. Um, I, I think one of the things is that that's part of being a fiber artist mm -hmm. is having materials, like just having all those options. Um, yeah. My mom grew up, my, I grew up in my mom's marine canvas shops. Um, Sewing push boat cushions, and um, you know, and just what using industrial fabrics and industrial machines. So for me, that whole exploration of materials is um, just really exciting. Mm -hmm. And um, so a lot of my work in Mad Weave I do now in paper, but I started weaving um, in 2010. I took Natalie Mebox sculptural weaving class for artists at Mass Art and mm -hmm. that was got me started weaving and her whole goal is to teach all the different basketry techniques not making baskets because she wants artists to make stuff so that she wants you to, to do work and then your final project to sort of incorporate whatever medium you've always worked in before so I did I just I wove this aquarium, which you're seeing some of the images. Oh, they're fabulous! Um, and um, but I'll we'll roll over and we'll look at look at because it, it sits here in my studio now, um, all set up as an aquarium. Mm. Um, Can you tell us about some of those materials, like the jellyfish and uh... the the jellyfish? Um, one of the jellyfish is made <laughs> with um, uh, water tubing, quarter inch. The water tubing that you put in your for to, to run to your refrigerator if you have a an ice maker <laughs> um, and gimp clear gimp um, and then the uh, the second one is made with monofilament wrapped around it. I'm not sure that's images in there. Uh -huh. um, yeah, so the jellyfish are made out of that. The the tape the squid is made with paper that I painted. Um, and then did a bias weave on, and then the eyeballs on the squid are actually gimp, um, and they're they're actually woven. Really? I, yeah, yeah. Um, some of the other materials. Let me let me take you over to my. Um, okay. Let me take you over around here to the aquarium because because not all the images are actually quite there. Not all the materials are there. Um, so the the fish. Let's see. There we are. <laughs> so so this big fish was the first real. Oh, I'm going to make sea creatures. 
because um, I had been a marine biology major, so they're all in my brain. So it's it's wire, though the spokes that run front to back on the fish are is wire, and then this is this is that screening gimp that the plastic that you when you want to put your screen back in your window you roll in. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's so I wrapped it around it, and the whole thing collapsed. So that it, that's how it became a fish. It didn't start as a fish. Well, um, did you draw? Do you draw your uh, images first? No, this is this just happened. <laughs> so so she has a starting doing a starting with a false base in the middle and building out from both sides. So I had this nice round. I had this nice round shape, and I was did the wire in it, and I was wrapping it, and then when I took that that cardboard piece off it, the whole thing collapsed into this narrow piece. So I was like, okay, it looks like a fish. So I finished weaving it, and uh, the this is black gimp that the whole face is made out of. Mm. Um, and this is this is a fang tooth fish. Oh my so God. I use nails. So these are all black nails that make the fins and the um, thing. And then in in continuing with the nails, I have this. Um, let's let's see. We'll lift it up. Yeah, there yeah. we go. There it goes. Um, so I made the sea urchin, and I wired it. I wired all the nails and and spiraled them together on on this. Yeah, oh so, my goodness. So more nails for that. And then the sea tunicates are more of the gimp. Wow, look at that. So where are you getting, are you, do you have a, a where's your source for all those, um, all these materials? Um, the, the, the gimp, the gimp is just that, it's that plastic stuff that you used when you made lanyards and in, in oh, yeah. summer camp, right? Mm. So I just get it at the art store. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, so the jellyfish has the clear gimp, um, and that's the same stuff. The, the 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 octopus. Um, I actually took the same screening material, but then I said, "Well, what happens if you make that into the spoke?" Lift that up a little higher, so the yeah, there we go. Thank you. Let me bring the camera down here a little. Oh, bit. oh yeah, that's good. <laughs> uh, so so then I took I had this um, cord and shoelaces, and so he's woven around that same gimp. So he's actually soft, uh -huh. um, huh. because he really has that whole rubber, that rubber inside. <laughs> um, and you know, and then I then I just sort of went off from there. The horseshoe crab is made um, is made with um, half with smoked reed, and my brittle starfish. It's actually like this foam filter. Somebody handed me this. Go, oh, you weave with things. So here is this, and I had no <laughs> idea what this was. Um, and but then I took eye eyelet um, and braided it like the oh, eyelash yeah. yarn. Mm -hmm. And because um, because then I was like, oh, it has to be a brittle starfish. So at some point I started doing the well. What material would make this? So this is my little brain coral. <laughs> Which is un unbraided rope. And Every, everywhere you look, uh, as you go through your day, you, you must be, you must look at, um, you know, all the, your environment uh, as a. What can I? How can I weave that? How can we, well, well, that brings us to the story of the elephant and the spider. Oh, actually, good. Uh -huh. Because they are the ultimate. Um, how can I use that? Right. See if we can get oh. those up here. Pictures of the elephant. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Keep going. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there, there I was. Um, we happen to be in. I'm an exercise physiologist, and I happen to be in the basement of a gymnasium, and discovered twelve treadmill treads, like the piece that you run on. Yeah. On a treadmill. yeah. So they wear out and they change them. What happens to them after that? Well, here they were all rolled up in a big box in the basement. And it was pretty clear <laughs> to me that 
there wasn't a janitor that was going to bother to take them back upstairs and put them in the trash. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, oh. So as a weaver, you're always looking for material that has flexibility and rigidity simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And what you can then that's part of why Natalie, when Natalie teaches her class, she has you experiment with all of that, that you um, understand what's going to happen to the material when you're using it. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. I'm going to I'm going to roll this out now. We'll look at the elephant and the okay. spider. Oh wait, here I want to make sure we all see. <laughs> this is live, live from this amazing studio. Look at Jean. There's. A couple little surprises that we, I want to get back to. Look at that. That's huge. So here's my elephant. She's four and a half feet high and six feet long. Wow. And um, she's made with the treadmill tread. <laughs> so I started making um, a column out of treadmill tread, which was my whole question was, with this material, how big can you go? What, how stiff is it? So I made these sort of one foot diameter by three foot high columns that were just about one treadmill tread. I cut two inches thick, two inches wide, and the elephant is actually the treadmill tread inside out. Okay. So when I had experimented with di with this these columns, they they reminded me of elephant legs. And then the question was, how big can this, how big can you go? So this actually has some metal bracing. It has some metal strapping, two-inch wide strapping that's integral to the weaving. In there's five of those, and there's some P thin PVC pipe that actually helps to support up one leg and from each leg to the next leg, all the way around. Hmm. Look at that. So are you using, to, to, as you do your weaving with a, an industrial material like that, are you using gloves or? Absolutely. Yeah, okay. This, you have to. I mean, I, the treadmill tread is, a, when you cut it open, it's 11 feet long. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it's actually rubber on fiberglass. So you have to use gloves because, as a matter of fact, I wore out a pair of gloves weaving <laughs> And long sleeves, actually, when the elephant was so big. There's a picture in there of the elephant insides yeah. where I took a picture and the elephant. Is that it right there? The frame, yeah. So now you're looking in the belly of the elephant. I made the back <laughs> end first. So you're looking at the back end. I had to support the middle before I built the rest of the head. And I was literally climbing inside. The elephant in order to get the elephant. Um, was, was this was this featured in the most in a recent uh, in National Basket Organizations magazine? No. Okay. How? What kind of weave is this? What's this called? This is mad weave. This is the mad weave. Okay. Yeah, this is the mad weave. The mad weave was in the recent magazine, but not the elephant. I see. Okay. okay. Um, yes, yeah, so the mad weave is tri as a triaxial uh, weave. It goes in three directions. Um, so it's actually on the elephant. It's pretty easy to see. Yeah. The three directions. Yeah. Um, most people know um, the hexagon weave as sort of the easiest way to um, recognize. A triaxial hexagon weave is a triaxial weave, but it doesn't have this star pattern in the middle of it. So it's really just this open. Wow, that's so, so beautiful. A hexagon weave is a really open weave, but then you take these six weavers and you you stuff them into the opening of the hexagon. Okay. I mean, that's not how you build it, but it's so tight that it becomes structural, which is what I love about hex the mad weave, is that in fact. When you turn a corner, so this corner right here, can you see this corner? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So this corner right here is a five-pointed star instead of the six-pointed star that we mostly see. Mm -hmm. um, and that turns a 60-degree corner. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. And then, then you turn, then you can turn, um, but you cannot turn a 90 degree corner. So you can't make a box. Hmm. Uh -huh. Which I really love, so it, it takes on all the organic forms. <clears throat> well, it does seem uh, organic, the whole nature of, of Madweave, but it also seems like it allows you to create uh, shapes that would might be harder with a different um, type of weaving technique. Yeah, I think I, for me it's all about the shape. I'm gonna, we're going to drive over to see the spider. Okay, <laughs> we're going to drive over on this. Uh, drive over on this. <laughs> Talk a little bit more. Oh, look at that splendid spider. Wow. So when I got to the elephant trunk, I um, I, I was trying to do the this narrow mad weave, and then how do you how do you control how narrow it is and m making corners without making the whole thing disappear? So it became making all these legs all different was my goal. Hmm. Um, and then I had to attach the eight legs together and build this abdomen. And hmm. um, yeah. So the elephant took me about six months, and the spider took me about eight months. Goodness. I'll never, when I go to the gym again, I'll never look at a treadmill the same. <laughs> oh, good. And then I have, I riveted them together. So I have all these stainless steel rivets that hold the treadmill edges together whenever you ran out of a weaver or they lap back on each other. Um, so which just adds, I like the effect of it. Um, right. but it was just necessary because it's too slippery. It won't stick to itself. Do you so. have a piece that you're is your most you're most proud of? They all look so intricate. Um, do you have I think my spider. I think I think right now it's my spider. Uh -huh. My one I made this year, and the web for the spider is knotless netted. I think we got um, another picture of it up there. Yeah, this is. Um, I used red fishing line, and the, the web is actually a Mobius. Huh. Cool. So I made a I made a rebar Mobius when I realized that it was a sing, it would stand up by itself because it's actually a single edge. Because um, I fought and fought with how to put the spider on a web without just having a big square that the spider hung on. Are you, are you using rebar in other works, or have you try, Have you used it before? You you make it oh, sound it, like oh, it's just another spool of thread. <laughs> this was my this was my first um, go around using rebar. Um, so I did. I took a little welding class and then went over and used my brother's welder and <laughs> he he like had he he let me build it at his shop and he liked it so much that we built just a rebar one that he's got as a lawn ornament. <laughs> <laughs> so this all runs in the family somehow, right? Um, my dad was an engineer. Okay. That which, says it all right there. That says it all, which is why for me, once I got to basketry, it was like, oh, 3D. Yeah. That, yeah, it was took fiber arts to three dimension, and that just, that was it. I'm, I was done searching. <laughs> That's so cool when that happens, when you feel that uh, connection with um, a certain process that that's all you want to do. Yeah, yeah, and it really it really was like, oh yeah, yeah, I'm an engineer, that's right. That's right. <laughs> well, um, you told me before we went live here, you told me, here, I'm going to go back to your studio space here, um, a, a secret, well not a secret, but I don't know if you could show, swing us over to the quilt that your mother made for you. I will, I will do that. <laughs> Um, we really enjoy seeing your workspace while we're, we can talk about that. All right, so <laughs> a little bit, yeah, oh, that's great. So I hope um, all our viewers are noticing that, uh, yes, an Olympic gold medal. And yep. um, uh, my yeah, look at the shirts from the 1980 team and the 1984 team. And um, I wrote a pair in 1980, which was the boycott in Moscow. Wow. And then I was in the eight in '84, and we have a gold medal from Los Angeles. That's really a, uh, an impressive, um, impressive quilt that you have there. But you're, it, it's interesting that you became a weaver and how your the mind thinks, because that we were talking a little bit about the rhythm of rowing. 
And you were mentioning how you get that same rhythm when you're weaving. Oh yeah, the whole the whole rhythm thing for me, I think, um, I think that led me to rowing as much as anything else. I had been a swimmer, which is also a very rhythmic. I I just I like that. Um, I like the whole rhythm thing. So weaving is that over and under and rhythm. So it's important. Well, I'm glad that's hanging in your studio. Do you do you tell us about your studio? Um, are you do you go there every day? Is it part of your house or how? It's not part of my house. You know, I'm gonna roll back into the other room. Okay. And um, this is actually the the entrance to my studio is here um, because I am an exercise physiologist in my other life. <laughs> And so this is actually an exercise room. It's kind of being taken over by creatures at this point, but it's still an exercise room where I can teach exercise. And then the back room is my work studio space. So we'll go back there. And look at all those, those drawers and buckets. Drawers and buckets. Look at that. And so what kind of things do you have in all those buckets? Yeah, just a, a little idea. Okay, so there's fabric in most of them. It's a regular cotton fabric, or when you say fabric, you know, you've been, you grew up with the marine fabrics, the marine I industry them, fabric. So I have undyed fabric, wool, I have them labeled, undyed wool and flannel, antiques and imported, commercial fabric, linens, because I have this whole acquired set of antique linens. Mm -hmm. um, Dyed hemp's and silks. I have another. Uh, I have. <laughs> let's see. I have two bins of fleece, um, batting patterns. Why well, I want my one of my weaving boxes is open. I have fiber for weaving, and I have natural fiber for weaving. And then there's all the stuff that's sort of stash that's not so neatly organized. No. And white shelves. These white drawers over here are all my dyed cottons. Uh -huh. So I, my quilt work, I do all with hand dyes. I teach, I teach fabric dyeing down at my, my mother's quilt guild in South Carolina. Uh -huh. Nice. And um, so are, you, are those sketchbooks? I, I, I know I was interested in if you sketch or how do you, I know some of it, just comes as you begin to weave, but when you're getting an idea, I did some sketches. Um, or are you looking at images and? I'm and looking. At, I'm looking at images a lot, and I re, I reference images over and over again. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're gonna come over and look at some. So when I'm when I'm making my elephant. Oh, look at that. So this is my little model I made, mm -hmm. and it was too cutesy. Decided that that wasn't the shape of a body I wanted for my elephant, but the head worked out pretty well. So <laughs> then I built another model. Yeah. Um, because the thing with the thing with Mad Weave, because these corners are determining the shape, right. I'm not sure what the shape's going to be. So I had to build these models. I really didn't like where this head was going, so I stopped building the head because I liked that one already. So I'm, I use this basic body textile on my big elephant. And then when I was building my spider, I did the same kind of thing. I built legs and then I sort of tried building a body to figure out where it would be and where it might go. Um, uh -huh. And you can see this spider is way different than the one that I ultimately ended up with. Um, but I did get some legs uh, you know, so so there's more ex in the other studies. I tend to experiment more with the shape in real weaving rather than drawing. Well, I love your hands back there. It's, you know, Rembrandt was notorious for drawing and sketching and right. his own hand, which is so nice to. I like to sketch my hand too, but that's a really nice. I hope you frame that someday. That's special. Well, that's, that's, really that's actually my very first art class I took at Mass Art, which was the semester before I took my weaving class, was huh. a drawing class. And I'd never taken an art class before. And this was one of our assignments was 100 hands over the week. 
Oh, that's a great assignment. I like it that. That's a lot to do, though, isn't it? It was, it was a lot. And, um, but you start to just draw one and forget about whether it's beautiful or ugly or whether it worked or didn't work, whether the hand looks like our hand or not. And right. you put another one down and put another one down because it's due next week. <laughs> Do you have any tools that uh, are your favorite tools? Um, I don't, you know, most of my weaving is done in paper. Hmm. Um, so so the, the, one of my tools I use, I actually hand dye my paper with fabric dyes. Okay. Um, I, I take the whole sheet, I use watercolor paper, heavy watercolor paper, and I paint it with the soda ash. Oh, yeah. And then I then I basically use the fabric dyes like watercolor, um, which I really I really love the effect of it. Right. And it's actually waterproof. It actually doesn't run if you get water on it. Huh. Um, because the fabric dye, it actually bonds to the fiber like it does in fabric. Um, so it so it creates a great effect. That's nice. Um, in in building. I have I have a couple of tools um, that would be medical, you know, little medical hemostats uh -huh. um, work yes. really well to just reach in and grab the paper. I have straight ones and curved ones, mm -hmm. and I took a pallet knife and ground it to a quarter of an inch wide so that it fits in. Because if I have to replace a weaver and move it or shift it, I need to get underneath the other weavers. The over and under, it gets really challenging to, to um, you need tools to help you do that. Right. Um, so that, but that's, but that's about all in tools. I'm not a big. I like the fact that most weaving is a hand, hand thing. It's a nice shape. So this is, I know these were my, these are my pots. Mm -hmm. um, so it's seagrass is the core, uh, the weaver, and then the twined around it is fabric. So some of my hand dyed fabrics, um, because I've been working to figure out how to actually use fabric in weaving, and it's not easy. <laughs> um, well, I'm I'm a I'm going through an obsessive phase of felting vessels, um, and that so I can really relate to that that shape. It's um, something that, and I'm just, but I'm using the wool and, and working it and working it with, with these right. tools. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, so that shape is just so beautiful. It, well, is, it is a beautiful shape. Well, I have, I wanted to know, well, I know Victoria's got a nice image here. Um, I just can't, I just love, uh, is it, those are just tapes, right? That's but, well, actually, that, that basket's called 300 feet. Mm. Um, because it is a 300 foot tape measure <laughs> that was that my sister works in a hardware store so she collects materials for me I like that. And, she, and it was all it had gotten returned the, the casing for it had broken and as you can well imagine a 300 foot long tape measure just doesn't so I unknotted it and I cut it up and and it's great because there's little red numbers all over it that are the feet Marking so you can find the one that says 300 on it, <laughs> and and um, and it still has the the metal ends on it and stuff. So oh, nice. Yeah, it's a nice. It's it's the piece is about 18 inches high. So that one got sold to a woman who gave it to her sister-in-law who collects tape measures and measuring tools and stuff. Oh, fantastic. That's so, great. Yeah. That's yeah. Great. Do you, do you, you seem so prolific. Do you, you know, ever, does your creativity ever come to a halt? Look at all these materials. And, and if so, how do you work through it or, or, or do you? Do you just keep moving through? Hold, hold on that one, Victoria. That's so colorful. Okay. That's my purple passion, which, um, yeah, it's a great piece. It, it, it's, um, it's not in good shape anymore because it, it, I shipped it off to a juried event and it didn't come back whole, oh. unfortunately. So I haven't, I sort of haven't dealt with the long term of that. But um, 
But you know, I always have a multitude of projects going on, and I think that that's for me that's what keeps the create creativity going because I have projects that they just sit there and I have no idea how to proceed forward with them. Um, so I don't. Right. I might go and tackle them, go back to them, and or I might just suddenly say oh, it's just I'm doing the wrong thing and turn around and do something else. That shoe. Yes, it, that shoe. I made that, I made that shoe for my um, my niece when she got married. She was a model, <laughs> and she just loves her shoes. I so, think we, we had, uh, we've shown this in Fiber Art Now magazine. Uh, some, so, some of your um, pieces, oh, but I think. Yeah. Um, but. And so, as yeah, there. Look at that and that image. And so the curly thing. Curling the tops. Yeah, that's. I really like. I really like curling the tops. Um, although other people are like it detracts from the weave itself. So this is a giant sea clam. My nephew, when he got married, was was um, living out in Hawaii, and um, they. I spent time in the Marshall Islands with giant sea clams. So the challenge of, again, that whole challenge of just can you make one, I think, yeah. is the driving force. Um, Someone, someone's asking the question, how do you curl those pieces? It's like quilling. I actually, my brother actually took a, I was already doing it, and I was using a, one of my clips, and I was actually spinning, I actually turn it on the clip. Um, but my brother took a nail for me and he ground it down and he put a little slot in it so I can slide it on the paper and then I can spin it. Mm -hmm. But it is, it's, it's turned like quilling. Well, you know uh, how yeah, right. So um, someone else is asking um, about, uh, asked if you had attended the recent NBO conference in St. Paul, um, Minnesota. Thank you, Victoria. Look at the, maybe you could talk a little bit about the, those pieces and um, in the conference. Yes, I did. I was just at the conference in um, Minneapolis, and I went to the one two years ago that was in Gatlinburg, Texas. And and this is this picture is um, it was at McAllister College, and this is in front of the cafeteria. And those big orange bases on the trees are reed um, that a woman had. Artist had two, she had a couple of interns, I think there were three or four, um, help her build them and spray paint them orange. Mm -hmm. um, so we walked by them every day when we went from our classrooms to the cafeteria and watched them build and t chatted with them while they were doing it. And um, they're going to stay up there for the year. Right. So they'll start to disintegrate, and I'm really looking forward to seeing snow on them because there's a little bubble at the top of the orange they'll collect snow and I think they'll look really interesting. Uh, have you thought of doing um, more outside yourself? or Does the elephant ever go outside? The elephant does actually. There's some pictures of the elephant on parade. Oh, yeah. I uh, put it on a garden cart mm -hmm. and, um, and the and dressed it up, dressed her up and, and walk her in this honk fest parade <laughs> um, I put on. I made a. I made a red and white ringmaster jacket. And Red, who's a, the son of a friend of mine, um, was the pooper scooper boy behind the elephant. Um, so we had fun. It, in October, it's a honk fest in Somerville, and the honk fest is is a street band event that they then parade from Harvard Square, Davis Square to Harvard Square. Oh, and, wow. um, so that sounds like fun. But what about standing sculptures? Would do you have any that out, are outside? Um, I don't. Um, just I put I put him outside on the day of day of my own studio. But generally, I don't have anything. Um, I think outdoor sculptures are problematic in terms of you know. These are soft enough to not take snow load. Mm -hmm. People can't climb on them. That's true. You know, so, right. so I think there's some safety issues around. I've I've thought yeah. a lot about it, but I haven't haven't broached that subject. Do you have any favorite artists that inspire you, or 
Yeah. This um, is your, your website right there, making sure we have that up there. Yeah. Um, you know, Natalie, I, Natalie Meebach, my teacher, I think, you know, as I've had teachers, mm. you know, just the amount of information they know and what they know about um, just sort of keeps you going, oh, there's so much more to learn. Um, but Natalie uses data for her creations. Hi, um, what do you mean? Explain that. She uses weaving as a grid. So she actually takes um, the information from the weather and in what hour it was in. So she might set up 24 spokes as 24 hours of the day. Mm -hmm. And then she'll weave one area that's the moon rising and the moon falling and then and then how the sun interacts with that so that there'll be another one and then what was the temp air temperature and so then there's that influences where her weavings go and there are all these crazy some of her weavings are gigantic they're like 10 and 12 feet um, mm -hmm. high across and she fills whole walls and does room size installations and um, and she just she's using data. Her father was an astronomer, so you know, for her, that's, that's all numbers get yeah. get placed in her weaving. That's so that's so interesting. I'd love to be in the same room and hear a conversation between um, the two of you. <laughs> Natalie Natalie actually has done a TED talk. Oh, she has. She Is has. that the one with the Mobius? The blue? No, she does all these big blue. Um, her figures tend to be blue. Okay, uh, M-E-I-B-A-C-H. All right, I have to go. Um, I'm a big Ted, Ted Talk fan. So do you have anything showing in galleries or do you care? Or you know, I'm trying to go down the business side of being an artist. You business, know? I haven't, I'm, I'm get sort of in the point of getting started on that, but I don't have anything in gallery yet. Um, I had 400 people come through my studio last spring, open studio in May. Um, my elephant being sitting outside my studio really encouraged that, but <laughs> Somerville, the Somerville Open Studios, they have over 400 artists at. Wow. So it's people drive across the state to come to our open studio and spend a day. Yeah. Um, you have to decide what corner of the city you want to tackle. Um, so, you know, with I, I think I had 300 last year, and, you know, I would say there's 50 of them that were the same people, and everybody else was new. So, Open Studio is my big source for just getting my name out there, and my website's fairly new, and I'm, right. I'm just sort of starting to get out there. Yeah, promotion is a hard, um, hard area, I think, for most creative people to, to tackle. <laughs> It's not something you want to spend your time on. Um, right. Someone, someone's asking um, on the chat. Was it, if, can we spell the name of the artist that you, the, the teacher that you had with the TED Talk? Um, yeah. Natalie. N -A Natalie. N a t h a l i e. Okay. Meebach. M e i b a c h. Okay. Here, I just typed it in for our. I hope I spelled that right. Good. Okay. Thanks for asking that question because, yes, it, we want to make sure we keep that on our video for so we can all keep looking that up. Um, well, so do you, what do you have coming up in the future? You know, August is, August is an interesting time of year for me because I've sort of, you know, I've finished whatever my major project is in May and for Open Studio. And then... I've sort of mopped up on all the other things that I just need to get done in August is where I start to really think about um, what I'm going to be doing next year mm -hmm. and ponder and do some experimental work, um, little stuff. I have a chair that I've acquired that needs to be retained, but I'm thinking I might not retain it. I might actually use that opportunity to sort of make it live inside a vine growth. I don't know. I haven't I haven't sort of gotten all of that planned yet, but but I'm thinking like yeah, using using a piece of furniture inside the weaving 
Oh yeah, it'll be fun to watch. Prospect. Um, let's see, Victoria's got some. Oh yeah, look at all that. There she is. There's, There's Natalie Maybach's yeah, yeah. work. Yes, I, we've had. I think we had some of her work in one of our issues at Fiber Art Now. Yeah. I'm, I'm not positive. We've. This is our fifth year. We're just starting uh, our fall. Will be the fifth anniversary of Fiber Art Now, and we're really excited about that. Um, yeah. There's Natalie's yeah, work. Look at all that. Data. Look at that data. Interesting. Oh, I'd love to hear um, hear her talk. Yeah, so go to her TED talk, and she does musical scores. And um, okay. well, also I want. Oh yeah, I think I've seen this one, but I need to see it again. Don't forget because, uh, that we have our uh, five excellence in fiber um, juried exhibit that we're um, going to be. Printing and, and publishing, and it'll get out. And I think um, I hope you consider um, putting a piece of your work in there, absolutely, uh, because it's just it needs it. it needs to be. Uh, we need to have someone using those kinds of materials uh, and weaving. Um, well, I usually kind of wrap up. Just I want to know what where you see the future of fiber arts headed. If you have any thoughts on that. You know, I think it's I think it's really exciting time because people are free to use so many fibers. Right. Like the definition of fiber has altered. Oh, no kidding. Um. So so I think it's really exciting. Two years ago, that and this is part of my background from my mother, the Industrial Fabrics Association. Um. um show they have a national you know they have an annual event and it was in Boston and I went and I got to go and say well and some people still knew my mother actually remembered my mom but basically I went and I said I'm an artist and I'm interested in, I'm a fiber artist I'm interested in you know industrial art and they were so open and so like oh my god I don't think we've ever had an artist come in through this show and but they were very excited about um <laughs> about that that whole possibility and um, you know cones of, and and so right now in Boston and fl um, flying over Boston is um, uh, oh yeah uh, what's her name's beautiful the, the beautiful woven yeah. network yes, yes. hopefully uh, some one of our could come up with the name because I it has left me oh, and her work is so splendid um, but you know, I went and saw her her piece up flying in Boston. It's like quarter of an acre large. It's they had to take panels off of buildings in order to anchor it down, and it, it it's it's audacious. And I'm like, I love the fact that's that good you, word for it. The fiber that there's a fiber artist that's just being totally audacious. Oh, that's a, that is good. That is good. Yeah, and so I think that that those two people represent very much represent um, where it's going. Yeah, I'm trying to. I'm on Google here, trying to see if I can find it. Because um, we heard her talk at Mass Art when I was taking Natalie's class. Well, it was a, quite a buzz on the internet. Everybody was, you know, sharing that information and uh, ooing and eyeing about her her stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you for you've been like extraordinary helping getting everything ready for our conversation, and I really, I genuinely appreciate um, your enthusiasm <laughs> and your most of all your your mad weaving and your work. It's really um, a delight to see it. Well, uh, thank you. I've been I've had great fun. I was very excited about doing this with you today, and I want to thank Fiber Art Now and the National Basketry Organization and yes. who have been great and wonderful and accepting of everyone um, yeah. that arrives. Yeah, right. Well, okay, so I'm going to sign off and um, Victoria, thank you over there for making sure we got all the images up there. Um, and if this should be up on our website uh, shortly <laughs> and I'll um, you know, then we can really start pushing it out and people can watch it anytime at their convenience. So anyway, thank you very much, Jean. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks, Victoria. Thanks, Victoria.